Hello, dear one. Today, we are going to discuss God's true divine nature. Now, what is it that makes the one and true God of the Bible, well, God? Let's get to it. God reveals himself to us in his word. So any teaching about God has got to come from his word. Now that is why God's word or the Bible is absolutely fundamental to the genuine Christian faith. Are we agreed? Good. And that is exactly why the enemy of our souls, Satan, seeks to undermine its authenticity and authority with the help of his minions, you know, false teachers, and of course, scoffers. Now this is classic warfare tactics, infiltrate and destroy from within and go after the foundation of whatever it is you're attacking, so it will not stand. But those who go after God's word to destroy it, they will not stand. They will be cut by the very word of God that they misuse and spiritually bleed out without even knowing it. And then, on the day of the last breath, when the silver cord is finally cut, they will hear the most terrifying words no one ever wants to hear. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. day of judgment, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Do I have your attention? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So, let's look at the definition of divine nature, and then we will search the scriptures to find the evidence of God's true divine nature. Divine, adjective, of, from, or like God or a God. And we understand God to be a supernatural being, a being that supersedes the natural world. Now, let's define nature. Nature, noun, the basic or inherent features of something, especially when seen as characteristics of it. Now, let's put those two definitions together and we get divine nature, the basic or inherent features of God or his characteristics on display, a being of supernatural powers or attributes believed in and worshipped by a people, especially a male deity thought to control nature or reality. I was personally taught by the Spirit of Christ as I read the Bible for myself. Now, why did I do that? Because I knew that God was not my problem. He was my answer. And what I found changed my life forever because I finally learned who my God is and that his divine nature or godly character is best revealed through his titles and the powers that he uses uh, to rule his creation. Powers that only he has. His omnipowers. Now, perhaps 
you have heard of these four Omni powers that the Almighty has. Now I will also give uh, some scriptures that show how he uses them to rule and reign supreme. Now only the Almighty has and uses all of these powers in any way he sees fit. No false god uh, can make such a claim, not even the pagan Greek gods. Aw, isn't it amazing how people can make evil look cute? And those omni powers are omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, and omnificence. Now, let's take a closer look at them. First up, omnipotence, meaning God is all-powerful. Now, this is the same as saying God is almighty. Now, I'm going to use the word omnipotence because, like I said, the translators used it in Revelation 19.6, and, well, the Latin just sounds cool, right? In the Old Testament, some symbolic words that are used to describe God's power and might are hand, arm, and the phalanges, or fingers. The scriptures that reveal God is omnipotent are Job chapters 38 through 41. Now this is where God schools Job and his three frenemies on his omnipowers, and they are my favorite chapters in the entire book. But for the sake of brevity, I won't read them all here and now. You can do that on your own. And I encourage you to do so. It's really good. Especially if you have a God complex. To my rugrats, I'm God on Earth. Yeah, exactly like that. Now, continuing with the omnipotent scriptures. Genesis chapter 18 verse 14 is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Exodus chapter 6 verse 6 Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, Jehovah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm, a reference to his might and power, and with great judgments. And we of course know how easily God decimated the mighty kingdom of Egypt with the ten plagues. Exodus chapter 18 verse 11 Now I know that the Lord Jehovah is greater than all other gods. For he did this when they treated Israel with arrogance. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 King Nebuchadnezzar's praise of God after he restored his sanity to him. All the peoples of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does as he pleases with the army of heaven and the peoples of the earth. There is no one who can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Next. God's power of omnipresence. God is omnipresent, or all-present, or he is everywhere all at once. And no, that doesn't mean God is present in everything. That is pantheism, meaning all things are God. Jeremiah 23, 34. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Now, listen carefully to how God describes himself here. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name, singular, is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Do you get the impression that God is three persons here? I know I don't. 
Next verse, Psalm 139, verse 8. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. The next omnipower is omniscience. God is omniscient, or God knows all things. He knows all things because he knows all things. Nowhere do we read that God acquired his knowledge because he learned what he knows through his experiences throughout eternity, nor did he read ye old cliff notes on knowing everything. Proverbs 15 verse 3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 13 through 14 Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? First Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9 And you, Solomon my son, know you the God of your father, and serve him with a perfect heart, and with a willing mind. For the Lord, Jehovah, searches all hearts, and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Which is exactly what happened to Solomon. So let us take heed to ourselves. And finally, God is omnific, or all-creative which means he created everything. Many of God's omnipowers overlap, like his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnificence in the act of creation, or when he foments his revenge on the wicked. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6 You alone are the Lord, Jehovah, you created the heavens, the highest heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to all things, and the host of heaven worships you. Again, the wording doesn't say y'all, it says you, and is clearly against any hint of the Trinity. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So people who do not know who God is are without excuse. Amen. Now, even though not all of these omnipowers are directly mentioned by name in Scripture, except for omnipotent, which is found in Revelation 19.6, the concept of God's omnipowers are definitely portrayed in scripture, as I have shown. But I thought the word omni is Latin, not Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek, not Latin. Yes, yes, that is true. Omni is Latin, while pas or pan are Greek words for all. But since the King James translators used omnipotent instead of almighty, I'm going to use it and them, the omni words. Like I said, the omni words just sound cooler, -er -er, right? Right! Now remember, dear one, I used to be a Trinitarian. So perhaps, like all Trinitarians, I just assumed that the three separate co-equal co-eternal persons ideology was God's true divine nature. Now, I don't even think I thought about it, to be honest, how to reconcile God's omni-nature 
with the three other god does. The three god does. I mean, that's what indoctrination is. You just take what they say. You don't think about it, right? Right. But I've since been healed of that deception. Thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ and his rod of correction. Suffering through loss and instruction bound in his work. So now I believe in God's true oneness as the Bible teaches, not the grossly inaccurate perception and definition of modalism, the straw man that Trinitarians constructed to justify their rejection of the truth of God's true oneness. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about who God is. Why? It's as if God really wants us to know who he is. Well, except for the Gnostics, they can never know who he is because they are blind guides who think themselves to be wise, but really aren't. I unsuccessfully tried to find a quote from a Gnostic, any Gnostic, saying how they believe God is unknowable, but I only ran into a heaping helping of great swirling words of emptiness, i.e. 100% pure philosophical garbage. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to have to take Irenaeus' word for it, that Gnostics claim that God is so mysterious that no one can know or even relate to him, contrary to the Gnostics' false interpretations of when God complains that evil people don't know who he is as being proof that no one can know who he is, I have found many scriptures about the righteous that say otherwise, that God desires that we know who he is and how he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him out in the spirit of truth and find him. Praise God. And so, to prove the spiritually blind Gnostics wrong, I have shown you the knowable God and how his divine nature is displayed through his only powers and true oneness. So, if any Gnostics happen to be watching, then just know that because you entertain a aligned spirit, Nothing I have said will make any sense to you. It's like that teacher on Charlie Brown. Remember? Wah, 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 remember? Ooh. Oh, come on now. Let's be honest here. Gnostics are spiritually dumb. They are deceived individuals who make good evil and evil good. And the Trinity is rank polytheism that is suffering from a bad case of strong delusion. I mean, just listen to this mumbo jumbo. Listen carefully. Close your eyes if you have to, or Look at the stunning visual aid that I made. Hey, that rhymes. Ready? The Trinity is... Three separate co-equal co-eternal persons, one God. Let's break this down. Three, which is more than one and will never be one. Separate, meaning divided units, not each other. I'll deal with the co-equal co-eternal nonsense later. Persons, plural, meaning more than one, that are all one God. Dear one, this philosophical drivel isn't biblical truth. This is forked tongue doublespeak, or a lie. How did this philosophical strong delusion pass as being rational thinking? I'll tell you how. Syncretism. The Trinity is nothing more than the syncretism of polytheism and monotheism. 
It's like those two awkward stepsisters of old who tried to deceive the Duke into thinking one of them was the mystery girl from the ball by cramming their huge feet into that tiny little glass slipper. And since polytheism and monotheism are diametrically opposed to one another, like those two Sasquatch trying uh, to fit that tiny slipper, it's a horrible fit. So, no Prince of Peace for you! Well, don't look at me like that, ladies. You're the ones that lied to the Duke by trying to put your gigantic feet into that tiny shoe. In fact, I think in the not-so-Disney version of that story, the two stepsisters cut off their toes to fit in that slipper. Yes? Ew! Gross! Well, you know that old saying, deceivers be deceiving. And speaking of liars, you do realize it is possible to tell a lie without knowing you're lying, right? When you believe what you are told without even investigating the validity of it, then you are now an accomplice of the lie. And don't try to wiggle out of the guilt by saying you were deceived. Eve tried that ploy and God shut her down. Yep, you got that right. And so, it is our job as believers, Bereans, to eagerly search the scriptures with a fair and open mind, shunning bias and ignorance to see if what they, the so-called Christian clergy, say is so. Why? So we can avoid being an accomplice to any lies. But when the honest theologians and pastors from the pre-cancel culture days outright tell you that the Trinity isn't found in Scripture, well then, how easy is that? Pretty easy. It is, but in order to worm their way out of being liars, the current Trinitarian clergy start their flim flam by telling you you have to believe in the Trinity because they insist that it's in the Bible via implication. And then they reveal the hidden implications of their God's trying nature by supplying you with their inverted and even fabricated scriptures like John 1 1 and 1 John 5 7 B through 8 A, respectively, to prove, prove the Trinity. Now, a quick shout out to Walter Robertson from the Sword of Christ channel for showing how the last verse of John 1 1 was inverted on purpose by the Trinitarian bias. And that is what Trinitarians do. They perform the false attribution fallacy or pluralistic ignorance fallacy. And do you know what? Their deception works. Because here we are. Now that's why a vast majority of so-called Christians hold on to the Trinity teaching despite the lack of biblical support. Now if any Trinitarians are still watching, do I have a dress to sell you? Isn't it gorgeous? Only the smartest and most spiritual people can see this beautiful gown. The fabric is woven from the most amazing fiber in the world. Reality, it's so thin you can hardly feel it. It's so dense you can't see through it. I can't see you. Can you see me? Of course you can't because this is triology. Want to try it on and go in the public to show it off? Be so jealous. Uh, no. No takers, huh? 
I wonder why. Well, I never was very good at sales. Now, I realize that since the word omni is Latin, or the Latin version of the Greek word pan, meaning all, there are those who will try to make a distinction between them in order to calm their discomfort with the truth. Oh, truly, there is no end to what philosophers will debate. Am I right? Let's debate that. Uh, no thanks, Socrates. See what I mean? Anywho, the logic is that God can't be thought of as being omni or all-powerful in the sense that he has no limits because, well, that would mean he is capable of doing evil. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Just because God can do anything, that doesn't mean he will do anything that goes against his divine nature. So, yes, all of the all words have a built-in limits based on the context of the verses. Now, scripture clearly says that God is light and good, even perfectly righteous, and that he despises wickedness and that there is no darkness in him. It even says that he does no evil. Or does it? Exodus chapter 4 verse 11. So the Lord said to him, Moses, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord, Jehovah? Well now, I don't know about you, but I think of being mute, deaf, and or blind as being evil. And then there is this verse. Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, Jehovah, do all these things. Ra is the Hebrew word used for evil and is also translated as adversity, bad, harm, hurt, wicked, and ugly. So here we have the Almighty talking about himself. And he says that he not only does good, but he also does evil. Now, how's your theology about God holding up so far? Uh, uh-oh. Now, I understand, dear one, I do. It's hard to buck the um, biased traditions of men and accept the truth about what God says of himself and his divine nature in his word. So the question here is, does God do evil for evil's sake or does he do evil to bring about good? Now I'll let you ponder that question for yourself for now. But of course, there are many more facets to God's divine nature, not just his omnipowers and, and or his titles. For example, the Bible tells us that God is light, God is love. Now, it also tells us that God is merciful and gracious, that he is righteous and patient. Oh, thank God. All of these characteristics help us to know who our God is. Now, even though the Spirit of Christ is spoken of as being synonymous with the Spirit of God, which is to say the Holy Spirit, for God is Spirit and He is holy, the Spirit of Christ was not mentioned in the Old Testament by name. Only the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. That is because the Spirit of Christ 
is a New Testament title, not an Old Testament one. God acquired that title after he acquired his human body in the womb of Miriam. Mary. So, this means, like it or not, that the Spirit of Christ is synonymous with the Spirit of God, but relating to the human person of Christ. For surely our one and only God became a man. So, do you still think God is a trinity of separate persons? Or are you beginning to see the light of his true divine nature according to his omni powers and oneness and titles? Now, if you still think God is a trinity of persons, then I encourage you to watch my next video where I will examine God's royal titles as related to his divine nature to see if what they, the so-called Christian clergy, say is so about the Trinity. Bye-bye for now. For the Bible is absolutely fundamental. Fundamental. It's fun to be mental. One more time. One more time. Let's clean my glasses. I'm getting a terrific glare. <laughs> Sun's right, right, right in my eye. Can you see it? You'll probably see it. Hold on. I forgot my prop. I'm eager to search the scriptures. Mm -hmm.